Welcome this morning. Uh, my name's Laurel Bowditch. I'm a scientific co-convener uh, for this year's Congress and also a PhD student and research assistant at Central Queensland University. I'll be chairing this session on the creative and cultural applications of serious games. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end, so please leave your questions for our presenters in the Q&A box. Make sure you put them there as soon as you think about them. Um, we'll be addressing them after both presenters have um, presented. We will hear from two presenters today, and because we have a little bit of extra time, um, it's not a big drama if they go over there 15 minutes. So the first presenter is Anjum Noeed from Central Queensland University. Take it away, Anjum. Thanks, Laurel. Okay, great. Hope you can all see that. So I'll be presenting uh, today on uh, allegorical narratives of the corrupted blood incident for COVID-19. Um, and I'm very, very pleased to be sharing this, particularly because Laurel, who you've just seen, is uh, not only a student of mine, but she's a colleague and also a friend. And she managed to wrangle me into this sort of work, which was a great thing. She's researching World of Warcraft and other uh, MMORPGs as part of her uh, PhD in psychology. So these are my co-authors, Laurel, who you've seen, and then there's uh, Janine and Tanya, and we're from Sikki University and Flinders University. Um, and we've done this project together. So the World of Warcraft, this is uh, a nice graphic giving you a bit of a taste uh, about what this game, this world uh, looks like. So essentially it's a, a massive multiplayer online role-playing game. Uh, which was released in 2004. And in MMORPGs, what we have is countless players inhabiting a virtual world all at the same time. Um, and it focuses on player interaction. Uh, here's a video. So you can sort of see, there's not meant to be any much sound in this. Just watch what's happening. These are players coming together, working together, questing. You can see lots of fantasy elements conversation, communication, engagement, the whole bit. Um, and it still remains one of the most popular MMORPGs. And you can do a whole bunch of different things in this environment uh, other, than exploring, ex other than exploring the open world. Uh, you can fight monsters, you can duel other players, you can complete quests. And then, you know, you could also uh, complete uh, missions, which quests, missions, which involve strategically raiding the dwellings of very powerful creatures. Um, and that usually happens in, in large teams and requires a uh, high strategy. So uh, in 2005, in September 2005, something uh, happened, which has never really happened before in this kind of environment. And that is that a software bug started an accidental pandemic within the world. There was a spell that was inflicted by the end boss. So you can see on the right there, Hakkar, the soul player. Uh, he picked up the second part of his name later on. Um, he was the new boss. He was the boss of a new raid encounter in a capital city called Zulgrub. And he had uh, the ability to uh, cast a spell called Corrupted Blood. Now with this spell, and the language and rhetoric of those gamers, it was a hit point draining and highly contagious debuff spell. So essentially it reduced a character's health over time. Um, so you kept taking damage points and it spread to other people around you that were close to you too. So you can already sort of start to see the synergies here between um, you know, the way that infection spreads in the real world and the way that the spell works. It should have lifted when the character left the dungeon, so once you were affected by it, but it did not. And what it ended up doing was creating an in-game epidem uh, epidemic, uh, which then became a pandemic because it spread to other um, parts of the world and it lasted for a month. And it really had the potential to um, infect and spread to every single uh, corner of the world of Warcraft. So, um, I guess the underlying rationale for this work is that, you know, our understanding of games is that they're more than structured play. They're about real people uh, making real decisions, working together with real stakes in many cases. Um, and, you know, gamification and non-game environments tells us that 
they can be used as very good tools for educational learning. But they're also a very powerful means of understanding highly complex situations like what we saw with the corrupted blood incident. Um, it's been described as a black swan event, which is one of these events that's very unpredictable and you don't know is possible until you see it. Um, and it happens and it's been used uh, as quite an insightful case for modeling disease origins of control by epidemiologists uh, as a large focus of their work. But no one's really ever looked at what the experience was of those that were involved in it. Um, and of course, since the novel coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic, um, it's become new again. People are looking more and more into it or it's come back and they've dusted it off and they're wanting to sort of go, oh, well, this is comparisons with that. So people are going back to it again. And, and what we're doing really is looking at it to sort of understand um, how threats perceived, how differences in that perception change, how people behave and so on. And it gives us a new opportunity to really look at what those experiences were to see what we can draw from them and what that tells us about the future. So this study aimed to understand more about player experiences during the corrupted blood incident using a research question, which was that in light of COVID-19, what meanings do players ascribe to their experiences of the corrupted blood incident in the world of Warcraft? Uh, so we did an online survey, uh, which used a qualitative orientation. So essentially it was just open field boxes to some questions that we asked people uh, and we recruited from a couple of community servers. Our main criteria was that people should have had first or second had experience with corrupted with the incident. And second in experience was being very, you know, one degree of freedom removed from someone who did experience it, such as a friend or a family member. And of course, being over the uh, years of, of 18 years old, over the age of 18 years old. Uh, open any questions and we asked for their experience, of, but we also asked for their experiences of COVID-19 in, in other parts of the survey. And it was open for just about three days. And in those three days, we had 102 participants that clicked the survey and we managed to yield 59 participants worth of data. Um, 39 said they had no experience with the incident and, you know, a few of them didn't consent or were less than 18 years of age. Um, as I mentioned, um, we were looking for different kinds of experience and 43 of those 59 had first-hand experience with the incident. 16 had second-hand experience. Most of them were from guild members or, co or close friends. That's the average age and that's the demographic po profile around sex. And we had 16 different countries. Most of them were from the US, but the majority were from the US just. Uh, in terms of our analysis, we looked at um, a, developing a framework that used tools from grounded theory, even though this is not an actual grounded theory pr um, project, um, the initial unfolding focus coding tool is a very, very powerful means of working through qualitative data to help find recurrent patterns and multiple meanings. And we combine that with thematic networks analysis to sort of understand whether there's a global theme, but also use it to visualize and go through. And this is what it looked like. So on the left here, we have in vivo. Um, and on the right there, we have uh, CMAP tools, which was used to visualize. And these two things were worked through together, quite an effortful piece of work. And so there are six global themes that um, I'm going to share with you. Sorry, one global theme, but there are six big themes that came out of this work that tell us a little bit about people's experiences and also offer some really rich food for thought for those of us that don't know much about games, as well as those that do and those that are World of Warcraft players. The first theme is that the bug, bug was unstoppable. And there were uh, three different categories here. The first one was flee. Death came on swift wings and the subcategory flee, you can see people see here saying, I remember trying to hide, move from place to place, etc., trying to get as far away from everything. There was a, a desire to escape what was happening. Then there was this idea that people were living and dying and repeating it over and over again. So in the game, you have the ability to uh, resurrect yourself. Once you die, you resurrect yourself and you've got to go and you know, search of your body. But people were dying over and over and over. And that's one of the reasons why you had just lots and lots of skeletons littering um, the world. There was no safe place. I remember vividly that you could not uh, avoid it. The bug did not discriminate. There were misplaced feelings of invulnerability from some players. Some people thought they couldn't get it. Uh, one person here said that, that, you know, they were a holy paladin, that they were confused and died a lot before realizing what was going on. And holy paladin, just so you know, is one of the highest levels of character that you can get. 
Um, so perhaps they weren't uh, wrong in feeling that they were invulnerable. We're talking about the equivalent of people that are probably like athletes in the real world, if you know what I mean. Uh, Non-playable characters were asymptomatic, so you couldn't even get to NPCs or you'd fall over dead, is what one person said. Of course, I went over to an NPC to check and immediately killed over dead. So there were people that were very high risk. Um, and then here you can see that pets were also able to catch the bugs. The so players in the game have pets as well, and they can use them, um, you know, in the game in various ways um, to attack others and so on, but they could actually catch the bug. The system is set up for the bug to flourish. Now, the design of the urban and sufficiently in these environments, which mimics a lot of what we have in the real world, meant that capital cities were non-stop deaths for that person. And every time the, uh, that, the other person said, every time I went to Ogrima, which is the capital city, to go to the bank or check the auction house, I would die. And these are key service industries for people to actually engage in the world to, um, to progress and level up. Um, initial infections were unintentional. So there were things, people were going around and there were infections that were happening and people weren't even aware of the fact that they were had it and they were able to spread it. And there was a morbid fascination for people that didn't know what was going on or were learning about it. And it actually put themselves in place of risk to understand what was going on and of course get the bug and then end up share, um, spreading it to others. And I guess that's the, the human element really coming in there. There was also power and powerlessness in systems of governance. So Blizzard, who's the developer, this person says that they just wanted to keep us busy. We, you know, called them, contacted them. They just wanted to keep us knowing from just how to control um, everything really was. And it's analogous to other in-world actions and activities. And that is that there are similar occasions when you're going around raiding that you would do stuff like this, or you would, you know, enact these kinds of ways. So this example here, this person saying that, you know, you could get a dragon and leash it into a town, not that dissimilar to the second Hobbit movie, I guess, um, and it would just cause chaos and destruction. And so there's some precedence for these sorts of things in the world happening as well. Chaos, confusion and catastrophe reigned. Three categories here, I didn't know what was happening. So we've heard some of this already, immediate confusion, lots of um, panic, didn't know what was going on. Some of the population was more at risk. Um, so people talked here about this idea that people that were at low level and that didn't have much health, as uh, soon as they got it, they were just, you know, it wasn't long before they were, they were, they were done. Um, and also those that didn't have the ability to heal themselves. So in other words, strong um, immune systems, if you will. Um, they weren't able to actually survive this very quickly, survive this for very long. And the death toll seemed catastrophic. So we're talking about very vivid descriptions of, you know, uh, corpses and bodies everywhere uh, once the infection started and took hold. End of normality in the world. So we've got a couple of themes here. There was lots of frustration, partly by the disruptions to the World of Warcraft. Um, Getting infected carried costs for gameplay. Dying in game had both a time cost and an in game gold cost. So you can see people here talking about, well, it wasn't just about dying, that this actually carried impacts for what we're doing. It would be, we would have to pay for recovery. Uh, we would have to pay um, in how we would progress through the rest of the world once we recovered from it. And there was a lot of irritation. And there was also lots of uh, very little information to explain what was happening too, which engendered further frustration. Risk aversity and restrict movement. So there was a lot of restriction to movement and engagement. You couldn't go into certain places. Uh, critical service and cheers, as we mentioned, and providers were very high risk. It was hard to visit vendors, trainers in the auction house. Um, people were piecing together information through live chat um, as, as often as they could to help build uh, an understanding of where they can and can't go. And, and there's some people who just ended up waiting it out, going, right, I'm disengaging with this. I'm just going to log out and I'm not going to come back. And, and that also, in many ways, hindered their movement within the game because they weren't engaging with it. Fear and ambivalence in the world. So what we have is fear and unease. So a lot of people uh, were actually quite afraid, very invested, of course, in their avatars of themselves. Um, and a lot of them were very, very, you know, sort of creeped out, as you can see in that comment. Um, some of them were anyway, uh, exploitation by opportunists and those with inferior goals. So there was this idea that some people intentionally created mayhem and chaos, people going out to actually um, engage with it 
uh, wanting to sneak it out and spread it elsewhere, try and infect everybody else. Um, and that's partly also because that you could use it tactically to gain more in-world benefits. So there was actually some advantage to, to be doing that. So this person here is referring to an area of effect spell uh, where you get a, an attack that hits multiple targets at once and of course get lots of um, in-game benefits from that too. The novelty were quite quick. Lots of people sort of said that it was fun at first. Well, that, that's the overall theme. Fun at first thinking it was a bug and scary trying to avoid it. At first it was snortingly funny, then irritating. Thanks, Laurel. Um, and then there was lots of vacillating of emotions. Seeing people flee, um, other people chase, many um, getting angry for women to spread, spreading great blood to and people both hilarious, but also kind of sad. Unwritten rules and social norms of decency were broken. So you can see here that there were people that were creating, you know, these schemas in their mind about what is and is not uh, good or moral around this. And this was quite telling because, you know, there were no real rules in this sort of scenario because you're just sort of in there um, getting on the world. And um, um, this people are basically saying, well, you know, there was an etiquette here and principles to follow which were being broken. So inhabiting and adapting to a new world, um, a few ones here, altruism and self-sacrifice for the common good. A lot of self-quarantining going on um, by some people, both within and outside places. Um, and there was an idea that also for some, the preoccupation took over activities in real life. So this person's here saying, you know, they spent the entire day on this, helping other people, whatever. And then they realized, oh, it was time for bed. Um, I had class that they had to log off. So it really felt quite invested in what was happening. Avoiding places of dense inhabitation. So working and questing around the risk, basically playing around the world, farming mats and such, playing out in the wilds, stayed away. So you can sort of see here that some people wanted to continue engaging with the world, but modified what they did and adapted to um, their, their style of engagement, their activities, their, the kinds of things that they can do meaningfully to continue engaging. And communities in unity. We had this idea of pre-monitoring, which is people forewarning others, almost the sentries or guardians, and kind of, you know, advising them not to go to places. Um, and in the game, we had a lot of people that were hanging around that were saying, you know, don't come here, don't go there. Um, because it was going to make things worse. And there was a lot of sharing of information to prevent the spread as well, particularly between friends and other guild members, um, saying things like, don't go near the non-playable characters, um, stay away, things like that. And then lastly, life after near death. And by near death, I mean, this is a game, and there were people that were dying, but they could resurrect themselves. Recovery, residual fear, nostalgia. So we had measures to deal with future outbreaks, that were put in place um, so that this doesn't happen again. We had ongoing fear of infection even after the bug from some people. Um, so it actually continued to modify what they do and how they do after the fact. And then we had uh, this idea that, well, life, you know, still went on. Um, you know, you fix the problem, people going back with their digital self and life and, and so on. And also this feeling that people are part of something that was actually quite momentous. Um, and, you know, there was this ambivalence, but also nostalgia around what they went through, and it was something they can still go on about, talk to others about, they were there, and they survived it. So just by way of a discussion, really, if games are simulations in which people play and interact and make decisions, then we can sort of see that they have real stakes, and there are some very clear comparisons that can be made between Corrupted Blood and the COVID-19 pandemic, I think. This idea of trolling and deliberately keeping the chaos going links to what we've been seeing sort of around anti-lockdown and anti-vaccine protest rhetoric. Um, the idea that there is an altruistic use of healing abilities and putting yourself at risk to um, ensure that things around you continue to function, but also motivated by altruism, um, or ignoring advice, isolation, hesitance around risk, misinformation, these failures of systems of governance as well is a particularly large one. And so it's really telling us a lot about the way that the, the people do behave and interact with this world. But, you know, broadly, I could say that corrupted blood was a virtual pandemic, but it was also very real. And I think that's our takeaway theme here, based on those people's experiences. 
our next steps are to examine some of the responses that we've got around COVID-19 to make further comparisons. And then of course, to publish some of this work and uh, you know, use more of what we can through gamification and these sorts of environments to help us understand more about the kinds of things that we're seeing. That shouldn't be there. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for your attention. I'm looking forward to any questions that we have at the end. That's great. That was an interesting experience to see that for the first time. <laughs> this was a surprise for Laurel. Laurel yeah. really well on these themes. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. That was excellent. Um, so our next presenter is Nanako Wasa from Hokkaido University. Uh, Nanako, do you want to start sharing your presentation? And you can take it away. Oh, okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can't can't quite see your presentation yet, though. Oh. I'll share your screen. Oh, this one. Okay. Oh. Hmm? Are you okay? I uh, still can't see the presentation. Oh. Okay. Oh, no, this one. There we go. Okay, so, so sorry. It's not in presentation mode yet, though, if you want to. Oh. Yeah, there we go. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Oh, uh, Aurel, thank you so much for introducing me. And I feel very honored to be here again since I attended ASC 2016 in Melbourne. So, uh, now I am presenting from Sapporo, Hokkaido in Japan, and here is Hokkaido, and here is Sapporo. And Hokkaido University in the mid of autumn season now, and these photos are our own campus. So, and I mean, my research area is community education, Indian education, the Ainu in Japan, Native Hawaiian in Hawaii, and active learning and simulation gaming. So today's presentation and introduction and the two in this section, I will introduce the development a process of a simulation game project PALU first, and then I will explain about project PAL after COVID-19. Three, and I will describe the high flex, uh, that is high, a hybrid flexibility format for the workshop and the game practice in the ESD 2020 program at the Hokkaido University. Four, and in this section, I will discuss on the educational outcome and evaluation and the function of the game for creating future vision of indigenous people, indigenous communities, and a conclusion. So, and most of uh, indigenous people have struggled with the difficulty of uh, being a member of an indigenous community and being a citizen of their country. They have been influenced by various impact for historic events, politically, socially, and culturally through a colonization and assimilation and governing policies. And to improve the social situation of indigenous people, a simulation game called Project Palo was developed for seeking solution to their uh, so social problem and uh, creating future visions for the indigenous communities. Through the games process and students and participants engage in collaborative learning approaches to understand the social program with COVID-19 faced by indigenous people now and to find a solution by using global, global press, local perspectives, think globally, act locally by respecting their indigenous knowledge. So first, an assimilation game uh, project about development and um, there are so many uh, spiral de design in I'm culture. I saw, I, I see many times this design and at the same time, and a spiral design in native Hawaiian culture and uh, design in, on Maori culture too. So, and uh, I find, uh, uh, I, realize spiral movement is very important for uh, indigenous people and uh, 
I started to find a spiral direct design in academic field. So, and finally, I found the SETI model. And the SETI model is a business admi adm administration model and has four knowledge conversion modes between tacit and ex explicit knowledge. And the four modes are socialization, externalization, combination, and internalization. Uh, and the SETI is an abbreviation of these words. So SETI, uh, each mode has each uh, conversion uh, process. And using uh, these four modes, I created four learning processes and act four learning activities. And so to make the actual learning activities in workshop, I chose and um, uh, collaborating learning method and a three learning method. And using uh, uh, seven techniques, I made uh, learning activities. So, and based on safety model and using collaborating method and the simulation game project to PAL was developed. So the part of game stage uh, like this, one, two, three, four, five, and the blue uh, words is uh, learning activities. So the first individual stage and the students and participants need to draw an individual image of symbol of the workshop theme. And usually I use uh, a symbol of peace. And stage two and students and you know, collecting individual image uh, and they made a, they make a group image one group image in learning stage and they learn about the game materials in stage four a planning and the students need to establish a global company and make a company logo and the three missions and stage five and so ah sorry and the planning uh, need student need to uh, create a public, public project plan as a solution and a stage five and a st uh, presentation field. So the game uh, materials like this, a game story and rules, map and history of indigenous local community and a social problem, five keywords, indigenous arts and internet information. The, depending on the workshop topic, I use certain article from Andre. So a uh, project the Palo game is for problem solving learning for social issues of indigenous people and has five game stage in the workshop designing future well-being in society and being as social entrepreneurs with a global perspective of think globally, act locally. So the currently the Palo game has three original versions, Palo Hawaii, Palo Ainu Seal, Palo Aiko. And I call is a young uh, leadership training game. And so the three sub version game is a COVID version, future hospital, and a TMT, a 30 meter telescope on, in Hawaii, and one student version. And this is not an indigenous game, but uh, refugee people or people on borders in Thailand. So, the COVID version, uh, Mr. Warner, uh, Mr. Kamal Warner in Hawaii was a co-facilitator in the collaborators. Uh, he supported a lot of, of this game and uh, he was, uh, he holds a master degree of native Hawaiian public health. And uh, now he was, uh, he is uh, to, uh, he is a, a scholar to assess how COVID impacted native Hawaiians. And it was very sorry he couldn't come uh, and join this conference. So Hawaii image like this and Oahu Island like this and the Hawaii version game focus on Waina area. But most of people, the image of Hawaii is Waikiki like this in tourism. So, but this image was until March, 2020. And so before COVID-19, Waikiki, beach was very crowded, but the last year was like this, very empty. But the resident people in Hawaii was very uh, pleased to see this uh, sport, uh, scene because uh, nature and ocean was uh, refreshed. So after COVID-19, we need to think about. 
So the social issues around the Native Hawaiians have long caused many social problems in indigenous community. And the COVID-19 has made the problem worse than before, especially in Waianae community. So Waianae area is this yellow zone. And this uh, area has five big issues of poverty, homelessness, drug abuse, poor health, and trust tampering. So the COVID version focused on uh, COVID-19. So we made uh, game materials like this. So we changed the game six and COVID information. So COVID information and Mr. Warner uh, to, to, uh, decided three keywords impacting on Native Hawaiians, underlying health condition, economic recession, and high cost of living. So usually part of game, uh, students need to solve the indigenous problem using their uh, indigenous cultural value. But this time COVID version added and three keywords of COVID-19 impacts and they need to solve the issues uh, respecting uh, indigenous value and uh, COVID influence. So, and the COVID version uh, was practiced at East Day Campus Asia Pacific Hokkaido University program. And three university students uh, gathered, attended, and one local community. So usually and five university from Asia and attended, but last year was very, very unfair. So the ge geographical distance uh, is like that. From Sydney to Hawaii and I over 8,000 8, kilometers. So the uh, Hawaii the COVID version, hybrid format net networks. And uh, I facilitate with uh, Mr. Warner online and Hokkaido University student group and uh, two faculty uh, offline. So and, uh, Mr. Warner uh, facilitates local group, local offline, and the two faculties managed with a breakout room online for a Beijing student group and a Sakhalin student group. So HyFlex, uh, hybrid flex format via Zoom was like this. So the part workshop theme was uh, health for COVID version. So still stage one and a student need, need to need it to draw a health image and a stage two and the student need to need it to draw a group image of, of using a stage one uh, images. In stage three learning, we used these materials. So, and Mr. Warner uh, presented uh, Hawaii social uh, problems and history and cultural value on Zoom like this. And so Hawaii COVID data like this, and this area is very bad. And native Hawaiian uh, variant uh, infected ladies so high. And I used the 2021 uh, latest version, but Warner, Mr. Warner used in last years. So a native Hawaiian lady is so high. So, and in stage four planning stage, and students needed to uh, establish their own global company and their company logo, three mission using a stage two uh, images, and they need to create part of project plan. So the uh, practice uh, photo uh, this. So two faculties manage breakout room and using whiteboard like this. And I facilitated classroom offline workshop and usually a classroom uh, workshop like this. So and the stage five presentation and uh, the students need to company uh, to introduce company logo and the three mission and the pilot project ground and they need to explain about why. So and usually an uh, online uh, offline workshop and 2015 version like this, and uh, uh, drawing a paper image like this. So, and the 2016 and Symbotech version, and Anjem tried to draw 
tried to solve the social issues of Hawaii, and he had a presentation. So I thank you so much, Anjem, at that time. So, and all online uh, presentation was like this. And this is a company logo and the Palo, Pro, uh, Palo uh, Project Plan from Beijing Normal University. And this is from Sakhali University company logo and a project plan and using an, a state, Hawaii state uh, flower, yellow hibiscus. So and Hokkaido University offline presentation and a company logo three mission and they show the Palo Project plan. And they uh, made a uh, cooking, cooking a center for Native Hawaiians to teach health, uh, healthy food cooking like this. So from Hawaii, and the, these are uh, individual image and correcting individual image, they draw a group image. And this is uh, Hawaiian um, uh, missions. Then they chose uh, social problem, trust dumping. Then uh, they used uh, Maui Hilo uh, region. So and using a uh, group image, they made a company logo like this and like this. And this is company name and three missions. So the, the Maui, uh, they the oxy the oxy oxyfy uh, the land and uh, industrial waste site so this is the image so the, this is a real uh, industrial wasting site in Wayana area so and uh, uh, Mr. Warner uh, explained about the fighting native Hawaiian fighting against to the building this site this is an actual program but uh, they hope to uh, uh, build it, build the community center like this on this side. So he explained the real uh, issues of fighting and their future vision in the communities. So the, the workshop was like this and the student learned a lot of from the real uh, learning stage and the discussion like, like this and the power of COVID version finished. So the outcome, educational outcome, and before and after practicing the game, participants were given a pure and a post uh, game questionnaire and a free description field. And I asked them about the knowledge of people and history and the social problem, COVID in Hawaii, and the potential for future hope after COVID-19. So the questionnaire scores were like this. And five point uh, scores from five to one. And this means that yes, from two to no. The uh, pretty score in blue is very low. But uh, after and uh, post questionnaires uh, became a higher score in that. All score is became higher. And it is very interesting and uh, more hopeful about the future and uh, that, uh, that score is very separated, but um, after the score is became higher. And so game uh, in free discretion, discre 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 student uh, said the game provided a deep broaden of the student horizon and enrichment and a great and amazing learning opportunity and experience for teamwork and hope to use a game experience for future voluntary work. And two uh, main critics, um, more technical guidance in explanation for the workshop and the pre workshop learning, such as flip teaching in order to complete the game and within the game time limit. So time management is always difficult uh, for facilitators. So, the educational function, the dual function, uh, show uh, indigenization and uh, decolonization like this. And all participants in the simulated community could experience indigenization through learning, understanding, and indigenous knowledge and decolonization by solving the social problem 
in indigenous community by applying the indigenous knowledge. At mediation, the game running process could provide an open and safe discussion and exploration of sensitive issues and indigenous topics. And the future uh, language, the PARU could help the uh, students, participants in global context to communicate and to create a future vision of certain indigenous issue across their chronological geographical differences. So the game uh, result showed that PARU has the potential for overcoming social difficulty by using human imagination, channeling indigenous knowledge to visualize the future, this future despite the hindrances caused by COVID-19, the expanding the education in a new way that encouraged students, participants to think globally, act, uh, create virtually and act locally. The power game running by Hyflex format offer a hopeful opportunity to overcome the limitations set by global pandemic through continued co education connection and envisioning a brighter future for indigenous communities. So, and thank you so much for listening and mahalo nui loa. Thank you. Thank you, Nanako. What uh, an interesting project and a great insight into Andrew's uh, artistic prowess, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, like so, <laughs> we've got some time for questions. Um, I might just go to the audience questions first and then I'll leave um, it open to you both to ask each other questions because I'm sure you've got them. Um, first, we have a comment from Jess who says, very interesting, and thanks for sharing your work, smiley face. Um, we have uh, Teal ask a question to Anjum. Anjum, were there any comments from people who were involved in the corrupted blood incident about um, that experience colouring or influencing their reactions to the COVID pandemic? Thanks for that question, Teal. It's a very good question. Um, we haven't started looking at the responses about people's experiences during COVID-19 in close deal, in close um, detail yet. That's the next step. But yes, there were quite a lot of examples of that. And um, they're not what you'd expect. So a lot of people talked, there was a lot of, there was a sort of sense of here we go again and a lot of withdrawal. So there was, we saw a lot of withdrawal, people talking about coming out of the game, leaving the game, not wanting to engage with it uh, when it was happening. And in the, by the same token, people were saying, no, in the same way, I don't really want to go out, I don't want to engage, um, keep myself isolated, it'll, you know, wait it out sort of stuff. But ironically, what they did when they were waiting it out or not engaging was delve further into the world of Warcraft. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was interesting, um, the kind of sort of stuff that we're sort of seeing people come back with. There's a lot of, there's this idea, and this was mentioned in the abstract, this is idea that people are um, immersing themselves more into these environments, potentially as a source of escapism, potentially um, as a source of coping, maybe to reconnect socially with others, given that there's not a lot of face time happening. And also that the world has that precedence for virtual social interaction anyway. Um, so there's a lot of stuff around aversion. There's a lot of stuff around, you know, wanting to keep away from things. And even not thinking about, you know, World of Warcraft is we've seen a lot of that kind of stuff, particularly during the um, first few waves of COVID-19 as well. So I think that that's been one of the main things, but we aren't going to know for a fact until we start looking at it in more detail. Great, thank you. Someone should do that research. Yes, they should. <laughs> um, okay, so I can leave it up to you. Andrew, do you have a question for Nanako? I have lots of questions for Nanako. Go so, for it. I mean, Take so over. So people might be uh, might stick some questions in in comments as we're talking. So please jump in if they do. Um, I was interested in the in the Seki model that you presented because I don't remember that from um, twenty sixteen when when we spoke to you. Um, how did you did you find it difficult to apply and and fit into your um, into your project? 
how did you work through that framework? It's still on mute. Uh, uh, yes, um, you, you're asking about uh, how I could find or how- The spiral model and how you kind of ended up using that for the phases of work. Oh, yes. Um, I really wanted to use a spiral design for, for indigenous people because in each spiral um, mode um, design for Ainu people uh, believes a spiral design protects uh, Ainu people. And so Native Hawaiian spiral is, uh, you know, a uh, fish uh, needle. And uh, Maori people uh, is uh, a symbol of revitalization. So, and uh, I tried tried to look for the spiral design on on the web many times. So I found a second model. So, but then unfortunately, and the second model had already had the process of learning process. And so, and it is very easy for me to a convert from such an uh, theoretical uh, theoretical mode to adjust an actual learning um, method I because and yeah and uh, originally and uh, I was uh, I I am an uh, intercultural communication instructor so I had a uh, many workshop so I used a lot of uh, la collaborating learning method so I used the collaborative learning method to put into the each mode to uh, realize uh, the learning activity in the classroom, so. Right, that sounds, <laughs> that sounds so clever, because I mean, I, I've been to New Zealand here and obviously in the Maori culture there, there's a lot of the spiral stuff that you sort of see. And um, I learned a lot about the whole Fibonacci stuff, you know, the Fibonacci sequence in nature being parallel to yes. the spiral. But it, uh -huh. I, I didn't, I don't remember that from the 2016 and, and it's quite a very interesting way of doing it because with those stages as well that you talked about, there was a lot of creativity in them. And mm -hmm. um, now that you've shown us some of those images of what's happening over there, it's taken a bit of time to get to, to where we are now. I'm, I'm very interested in your comments on the rejuvenation that you described following COVID, you know, the withdrawal of people from the tourist hotspots during COVID-19. So what's the, what's the general perception there since that's happened? People have liked the fact that there haven't been people there and there has been rejuvenation of the environment? Um, uh, sorry, and are you asking about uh, a student? No, I'm asking about the comment that you made about the Hawaii and during COVID, during COVID-19, uh -huh. people weren't coming and uh, the beaches and the environment was, sounds like it was getting restored. Oh, you are talking about the recent peoples. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, uh, no, of course, and uh, residents in Hawaii and native Hawaiians are, are very pleased to see the no one on the beach. <laughs> because then the ocean uh, became a very, very clean and the various fish returned to the ocean, it's especially Hanauma Bay became a uh, uh, returned up. Transparent rate is very high. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, maybe um, they don't want to, to return the tourism uh, people, but um, uh, you know, the tourism business and economy need to uh, visitors. So, and uh, Hawaii didn't lock down, do the lockdown. So, and uh, Native Hawaiian uh, was very angry. <laughs> yeah. So, because then most of uh, people from America uh, look for the empty place because they don't want to, to be infected. So in Hawaii, many people gather. Yeah. Do you, are we you're still okay for time for questions, aren't we, Laurel? Uh, yeah, we've got till quarter two. Uh, I actually had a question for Nanako. Um, yeah. How do you see your program being generalizable to other indigenous populations? Have you used it in other indigenous I was populations? I just about to ask that. <laughs> well, <laughs> great minds. <laughs> yes. Um, 
First, I, I made a, a native Hawaiian version. And second uh, was uh, Ainu, a university student, uh, made uh, a part of uh, Ainu Mosil version. Ainu Mosil is a uh, Hokkaido in Ainu language, just like uh, Aotearoa in New Zealand. So an uh, Ainu Mosil version, uh, Hawaii, uh, no, sorry, Ainu. And so I call version, uh, the game used uh, Maori cultural values to uh, encourage young people to become uh, leaders, leaders. So, and the uh, three version uh, respect on three indigenous cultural values, but uh, uh, managing uh, game materials. And uh, I think uh, I, I can make more indigenous versions yeah yeah because i think it would be quite an interesting um interesting approach for application in australia as well oh yes already are you working with anyone in australia to look at its application here? Um, not yet all yeah, right not well, yet any yeah, viewers impossible. interested in collaborating with nanako please get in touch with yes her. yes and because this game is very easy and so, and I realized, and uh, indigenous people sometimes cannot speak easily. It means uh, they have a voiceless voice, but um, they cannot speak well. It means, uh, uh, how do I say, it? logically or uh, you know, academically, they cannot speak uh, local people. So, and drawing image is very important for them to come out their program and so on. And so we can share the image. And sometimes, you know, a word has many connotations. For example, poverty is very different and for each person. And so the uh, uh, drawing image can help us to understand the different culture value, different program quality and so on. So, and uh, I'd like to, to use to use uh, this game for uh, local people, especially indigenous people. Mm. Right. Yeah, the whole the creativity in drawing and externalizing your knowledge. I mean, that's stuff that I really, really enjoy. And it's really important. I mean, it's the best, it's one of the most versatile and insightful ways of um, just eliciting knowledge and externalizing people's knowledge. And we certainly saw that when I took part in your workshop back in 2016. So oh, it was a yes. very rewarding yes. process as well. Yes. And uh, I, yeah, I remember Yeah, your presentation was so great. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> so how are we doing, Laurel? Uh, yeah, we're, we've still got a bit of time. I did want to ask you, Andrew, about... Um, Blizzard have tried in the last uh, few years to introduce their own kind of simulated pandemic, um, the introduction of a zombie invasion in Wrath of the Lich King, for example. Um, the experience then, I think, was more of, you know, people trying to cause as much mayhem as they could. We didn't see the same type of reaction. Um, what do you think we can learn from uh, an experience like your black, the, the corrupted blood black swan event being um, kind of happening organically compared to something that's trying to, that, that has been done on purpose. And how does that aid us in predicting like the human response to, to situations like this? Oh, that's so many, so many. Well, it's one question questions. really. What's the difference? It's one question really. What's the difference between introducing it, it being introduced organically to being, you know, something that was planned and the human response re related to that. Yeah, well, I guess, I guess, I mean, like the, the, the idea of the Black Swan event is that it was unprecedented and people didn't know what it was and they were making up as it went along, as you say, organically. And yes, we've had epidemics and stuff in our own lifetimes around the world in various different corners, but it's the first time that most of us, probably all of us, have really experienced this kind of pandemic and the impacts which have been far-reaching um in the gaming context once they did it i guess the real versus not real thing and the precedence that it sets kind of 
ends up affecting what you do when it's planned and they're announcing it presumably they said we're going to do this people are probably getting ready for it <laughs> and they're going to be going right this is going to be my chance to be part of something and experience what it might have been like and so you're entering into a simulation more than you were entering into it before because it wasn't a simulation before it was something that was a bug um, that happened and Blizzard didn't know what was going on, people around didn't know what was going on, and they were essentially adapting to it and reacting to it and doing all those things. You're probably going to find a lot of those sorts of things happening again, but because it's planned, it means that there's some control and it's more of a simulation than it being real in a simulated environment, if that can be, if you can get your head around that. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. And, and the, what I was thinking is that it, it's kind of it, difficult then to predict. I know epidemiologists um, studied corrupted blood because it was an event that happened organically, but I don't see the same thing being able to be done when it's a planned event that is announced. Oh, no. But, I mean, it's the yeah. same thing in our world. I mean, like, to what extent can you, you know, look at, I mean, it's not, it's, it will be difficult to create a controlled experiment, if you, mm. if you know what I mean, if that's what they're going for. But I do know they've been, you know, reflect, they've been harking back at that. And, you know, um, it's been used in various ways to reenact, reenact what happened for the people around, because it's become a point of nostalgia now, you know, you were part of something, you were there. But I still think there's a lot of learnings from the actual event, which is why, you know, we've done the project that we have because there's a heck of a lot that you can find out about these sorts of unprecedented events and what can happen. And now that we've had COVID and we're still going through it in many ways, then what does that mean in terms of what follows, which is where that theme around, you know, moving forward, life going on, still having that fear, um, all that becomes very relevant because that is an indication for us on what we can find on the other side and how we will think back and reflect on this if we ever get out of it. Yeah, definitely. I think it's interesting that originally, when it originally happened, it was kind of a epidemiological approach to looking at the, the, the way that the virus spread through the world. And now that we have COVID-19 as a context, it's kind of brought more attention, brought our attention back to, to, the, to the incident itself, to look at the way that humans interact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the people side is quite important. Mm, definitely. Um, well, we don't have any other questions, unless, Nanako, you have a question for Anjum. We've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, you're on mute, sorry. Okay. Uh, yes, um, this play, uh, game play is a single play or team play? It's, it's single and team. <laughs> it's maybe you can answer this, Laurel. So you, you can work together in groups and teams. You can, you have a guild, you have like a faction, a group, mm -hmm. and you, you quest together. You have to strategize together. You, by quest, I mean, you know, you go on missions and those missions might mean defeating bad guys, bad people, bosses, and then getting the reward from that because mm -hmm. it helps strengthen your character and you let it grow. Or if you're a single player, you can just go out in the world and play things on your own as well, can't you, Laurel? That's right. It, it's a massively multiplayer online game. So the aim is for social connection. I, 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 I guess um, that's what they want. They want us to play together and in, in defeating things together. They have oh, uh, yeah. you have the ability to form groups called guilds that are people that you know. But mm -hmm. like Andrew said, you can get on the game and just play by yourself and not interact with anyone. You're probably not going to get very far. But um, yeah, it, it's more a multiplayer game than anything. I see. I see. Yeah. So, so an Anjum introduced many findings. So and uh, from their interview or something like Lots that. Of themes, yeah. So, themes. Yeah. So, so, so how uh, will you use such a finding to update your game? Oh, well, we're not going to update the game, but what we're going to do with the findings is well, our next step is to look at some of the things that Teal pointed out, which is to understand, you know, how people interact with the game, oh. but also how that then mm -hmm. affects the way that people interact in the world now, given that we have a real pandemic around us. It's just to essentially understand more of what the experience was like and to focus on the incident in a not purely epidemiological way, which is the way that it's been looked at already, to mm -hmm. get some of those, you know, key insights on behavior and engagement really um and see what we can learn from that 
Okay, that's all Thank you very much. time for, unfortunately. I wish we could all gather up in a together and have a longer conversation. Um, <laughs> so thanks to Anjum and Nanako for um, your presentations and thank you everybody for joining us. We're going to have a break until 11.15 uh, daylight savings time. Join us then after that for the second Australian Defence Briefing in Track 1, abstract presentations in Track 2, and a presentation on Games for Change Asia Pacific 2021 recap by Adrian Webb. Enjoy your break, everyone, and thank you again. <laughs>